A special meeting of Apache Junction City Council to order. Roll call. Mayor Surdy? Here. Vice Mayor Wilson? Here. Council Member Barker? Here. Council Member Evans? Here. Council Member Rizzi? Present. Council Member Struble? Here. Council Member Schroeder? Here. Do you have a quorum, Your Honor? Bryant, do you want to get it started? Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Bryant Powell, City Manager. Tonight before you is your third public meeting and second public hearing on the fiscal year 2019-2020 budget for the City of Apache Junction. <laughs> the annual uh, budget is presented for your consideration each year and the goals and objectives that have been presented over the last several months have been consistent um, with the effort of the, the, the city departments. Tonight we are available with a public hearing to answer any questions that you may have and um, move forward. This is the third step. The, the first step was to adopt the temporary or the um, tentative and this is the final. Um, we stand prepared to answer any questions you may have. Are th is there any questions or discussion? Any, okay. I think this is a public hearing. Does anyone want to speak on this? Hearing and seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Any last discussion? Then I'll call for a motion. Your Honor. Yes. I move that resolution number 19-12, fully adopting estimates of expenditures by the City of Apache Junction for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2019 and ending June 30, 2020, declaring establishment of the budget for the City of Apache Junction for fiscal year 2019-2020 and declaring an emergency be approved and adopted. Second. Second. Roll call. Council Member Barker? Yes. Council Member Struble? Yes. Council Member Evans? Yes. Council Member Rizzi? Yes. Council Member Schroeder? Yes. Vice Mayor Wilson? Yes. Mayor Surdy? Yes. Unanimous, Your Honor. And with that, we'll adjourn that special meeting. Thank you, Donna. We now have a budget. I know it's a lot. It's free to spend money. And I appreciate it. I'll now call in the uh, Apache Junction work session. Roll call. Mayor Surdy? Here. Vice Mayor Wilson? Here. Council Member Barker? Here. Council Member Evans? Here. Council Member Rizzi? Present. Council Member Struble? Here. Council Member Schroeder? Here. You have a quorum, Your Honor. Presentation and discussion on an intergovernmental agreement with Maricopa County for Geographic Information Systems, JC. Your Honor, as JC's coming up, I am thrilled to introduce him as well. You may, may wonder where all our wonderful maps have been coming from. And they are our GIS division, and JC's a rock star, and we're so thankful to have him. And it's basically him and one other staff member. But JC, sorry, just wanted to let everybody know who you are. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so like, like uh, Brian had just said, I'm JC Kleiner, the GIS coordinator. Um, I'm here tonight to present information regarding entering into an IGA with Maricopa County for GIS data and imagery services. Included in the packet is a copy of the IGA that we received from Maricopa County. Uh, the city is a member of the, has been a member of the county's imagery group and purchasing imagery from the county over the last 10 years. Um, just recently, it's been a relatively informal process, uh, and just recently they've uh, requiring all of the member agencies to uh, sign IGAs. Um, Im imagery plays a vital role in the variety of applications that the city staff uses, um, and it's highly beneficial to visualizing the data and the, and, uh, the information that we maintain. So I just wanted to give you an example of the imagery that I'm, I'm talking about in one of our GIS web applications here. So it's high-res imagery um, that we receive from Maricopa County annually. Uh, one of the benefits of being a member with Maricopa County is it includes 25 member agencies. Um, that kind of reduces our cost sharing uh, for this imagery. So we receive a really good product at a pretty affordable price. So, um, this item is on the consent agenda tomorrow night for, uh, for your approval. Any uh, questions or comments? Just one question. Can you explain the difference between this imagery and, say, Google Earth? 
to know what we're paying the difference for. Yeah, sure. So, well, Google Earth is going to be proprietary to the, you know, Google itself. Uh, so you can't really purchase imagery from them. Um, I'd say the, the biggest benefit to this is we are able to control the information that we see. So, so the information on the map is, you know, our streets, you know, our, our information with, a, with uh, an imagery background. So we wouldn't be able to do that through like a Google application. So this continues to allow us to be able to visualize our GIS data um, through our own application. And what application, you, it, um, we have done different layers, or app, do you interchange the word application with layers? Uh, or well, I, I consider this my, uh, my application here. So this is our, our GIS <coughs> web portal that has a variety of different applications. So you can click into, let's say, the FEMA floodplain viewer and you can see a whole bunch of information, and then inside of here, there's additional layers that you can turn on and turn off, depending on what you would like to see. So, so the layers are, are, gives you the attribute information, the, the imagery gives you kind of that background. This is huge for economic development. This is huge for the development community. This is also huge for our community, <clears throat> questions about zoning, and, and where they can get answers to questions for themselves without always needing, to, needing us to walk through it, correct? Yeah, the, and this is available to the public right now on our city website. So um, not all of the applications are, are public facing, but there are um, zone, like uh, Bryant had said, zoning applications, and then um, there's several others. Actually, here are all the ones that any citizen can, uh, can reach, so. So this is obviously satellite technology. Uh, this, the, the imagery that we're receiving is, um, it's flown by a company called Eagle View. Um, and so it, it's acquired by actual like flight paths. And drones? No drones. Like manned aircraft okay. taking, taking pictures. Because like when you were zooming there, I was wondering how low you could go because they've always said that you could read a license plate with a satellite. No, it, this, Im this imagery is, is not that accurate but it is it is um oh wow it, it is pretty high res it's uh, i believe it's 0. 0.3 foot resolution so this is work session for discussion obviously one of the things we get into when we talk about code enforcement is should they be looking over people's yards and if they can't see it whatever but with this you don't need i don't mean yards over their fences with this you don't need to look over their fences if there's a legitimate reason, Joel, we're legally allowed to access this <coughs> to look into people's, man, look at the mess in that yard and here we would know what's in that yard. Mr. Mayor, Mayor of the Council, I knew this question would come up. Um, there's case law that says it's against the Fourth Amendment to identify code <coughs> violations through the use of uh, technology that you would not be in a place where you're legally to be. Um, for example, if you're in someone's yard, you're in the next door neighbor's yard, and that next door neighbor lets code compliance in, and they're able to take a picture because you could see through the fence. That's okay. However, there's case law that goes back to the 70s where someone was using binoculars, and they were <laughs> looking at someone's uh, drug deal and basically they were not, that magnified the, uh, the image, but that was not considered legal. So I think, and I think there's some case law that says the same thing with use of satellite. Now, if you, if you have the consent of the person, could you use it? Yes, you can do that. And there's certain situations where this information or this technology comes in handy. There's also a proof problem in court. It's difficult, especially if you're using, if, and I think co-compliance uses Google quite often, Google Earth. And to get an image into evidence, you have to get it certified. There has to be, you have to lay the foundation of how it was received and who took it. That is not an easy thing to do. So, to, to the short answer is, I don't think your co-compliance matter can be based on this type of technology. There has to be something in addition to so maybe you could identify there's problems and then you go, okay, well, we think this house has a problem. We can see it. So let's go knock on the door and see if they'll let us in. And then if they let you in, that's called consent. 
And so then the Fourth Amendment doesn't come into play. So how often is this updated? We purchase the imagery annually. So we have imagery going all the way back to 2007. Uh, it's flown, it's, the flights begin in generally October, and then we received it. We just received uh, the 2018 delivery in May. So it takes a, you know, a few so months. So the whole for city them. got redone in May? Well, we received the imagery in May, but it was flown in October. Okay. And all of that has a, it's a date stamp, and you know, we, we have the information from the contractor if there was questions about when that, when that image was taken. So, JC, we receive the imagery once a year. Once it's about year. six months old by the time we get it, and it basically represents a snapshot in time on that day that they flew over and took the image. Right. So it's not like a everyday occurrence or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. annually once a year. So it would be tough to do code compliance because if right. they didn't, do, if it wasn't there in October, but there in January, yeah, or whatever. So we use it for a variety of other things. Um, we once a year we go through and we'll update our building footprints. Um, you know, we use it for asset collecting, so we're not having somebody in the field having to drive around to collect. You know, uh, where a fire hydrant might be located. The imagery is accurate enough that we can see a fire, fire hydrant or a street sign or a street light uh, without having to go out into the field. So there's, there's a lot of benefit there and time saving as well. If I may ask one question, may I, may I uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes. Um, this is good to show federally patented easements and also right of ways, is that correct? Yes, we have an application that is uh, for internal use only that has right of way uh, federal patent easements. Um, and some additional information that our city staff can use. And that comes in handy when there's property disputes between property owners? Yeah, I would, I'm, I'm hesitant to talk about, uh, um, I guess, property disputes because I would say our parcel layer, we maintain ourselves, um, but I'd always refer to a, a registered land surveyor um, if there was an issue with uh, a property line, but we're, pretty accurate. We use our, our um, grid system to do all of our digitizing and stuff, but we, it's not, I can't say it's a, you know, a survey document. Cool. Any more questions or comments? When it was zoomed there, you know how we always look at artists' renderings and they always put plants in? Those plants look just like artist renderings <laughs> when, you, uh, when you zoom on them for. Yeah. It's interesting, but at the same time, it can be intrusive. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, there's, there, it, it, you know, I can see that, but it's also, there's, a, you know, all the departments use it, you know, public works, development services. Um, our, the CAD dispatchers have this imagery available in, the, in their new um, program as well. So it, it's used across the city in, in multiple different ways. So yeah. is this what the police use as well, or? for the up-to-date photos, like when we're having a flood, or does that come from Google Earth? Um, there, I, I'm not sure if like, uh, like flooding events, how, how that imagery is captured, um, but uh, they, they do have this imagery service available in their uh, CAD program for the, for the well. dispatchers. Okay. So. okay. This will be on the consent, consent agenda tomorrow? That's right. right. All right. Mr. Mayor? Yes. I, did, did I hear you correctly? This is available to the public? Yes. This right here, um, this is our kind of homepage to our portal. Um, and then any applications that you see across here, any, anybody can reach. So if you hit on the, the first one here, um, I noticed if you go down um, Main Street or the trail, like for example, Dutch Brothers, Panda Express. And the, the public's gonna see this and they're gonna think, oh, we're getting a Panda Express and a Dutch Brothers, right? I mean, and the next thing you know, a Facebook page blow up all over the place that we're getting all these things going on. Here. It never happens here. We right. <laughs> so one of the applications we saw recently in Governing Magazine that one of, one of your fellow council members asked about, can the city do this? And so these are applications we want to roll out. I want to be visiting with you here pretty soon about an application like this that could help on the process. One of the most often questions the city manager gets is about development. One is the car wash coming in. That sign has been up since 
four years ago. Well, yeah, it's private property. The private property owner put up a sign and they're working through the process. The private property owner didn't recognize that when they put the sign there, that it was on an ADOT road. They did not recognize there were easements. And so we get, meaning all of us, tons of questions about what's coming, what's not. And, and, and what we're finding out is that many communities across the United States are utilizing GIS layers to help people understand where the uh, private sector may be on the process. Are they looking at rezonings? Are they just talking about? So this was our first little example, I think, that we wanted to, to meet with you on. And we, we can see how far we want to go with it. But it could be a place where you all can utilize to help the rumor on where it's at and point people to a place and then they can follow it themselves for, for future. And the, the case activity viewer that we were just looking at um, is open, but we don't have it advertised on the city website yet either. So you would have to be able to navigate to that location to, to access it. But we to do have the potential to, yeah. to, to block that stuff, protect it with a password as well. But this is the uh, GIS page that the public can access from our website. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, JC. Thanks. Presentation and discussion on the City of Apache Junction's Public Safety Personnel <coughs> Retirement System. Donna. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Donna Minerts, Finance Director. First of all, thank you so very much for adoption of the final budget. We really appreciate that. So tonight I'd like to speak to you about House Bill number 2097, which is regarding the pension funding policy. The annual, annual requirements of the policy are to adopt the pension funding policy that is formally going to accept our share of the PSPRS assets and liabilities, and then that policy will be posted on our city website. So some of the objectives of the policy are to establish how the city will maintain the stability of our contributions to PSPRS. Council has already adopted city ordinance 1418. That's dedicated revenue, the 0.2% TPT to go toward public safety costs. So you're already doing that. <coughs> and how and when the city's funding requirements will be met. The annual required contribution and the unfunded portion, unfunded liability, are both paid bi-weekly through payroll deductions. So that's how we are, are meeting the city's funding requirements. Our target and timeline for reaching our goal of the funded ratio is 100% funded by June 30th of 2036. Wow. So the next step is that I recommend that approval on Tuesday, June 18th, 2019, of the pension funding policy. Do you have any questions? Are there any questions? <coughs> it doesn't look like it. Thank you very much. So thank you. Thanks, Donna. Presentation and discussion on a model uniform cable TV and video service license agreement and corresponding application. Joel. Mr. Mayor and Council, uh, if you'd go to the item. Okay, hold on. Um, and go to, oops, just click, yeah, just click something's wrong with this, Bryant. Just click like a soft click. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Gotta have a touch. Okay, <laughs> I've provided a memo and also a bunch of SBs and HBs. I'm sure you all have read them, especially the blue language. That's the new language. The most important part of this is, are this, the last two items, application and affidavit and license agreement. And basically what SB 1140 did in 2018 was it required cities and towns to adopt this model application and affidavit and license agreement that will be offered to cable operators. The intent, I, well, I know what the intent is, but I won't say what it is, but <laughs> what I believe they want to do is formalize it and uni make it uniform throughout the state so that every license agreement for cable TV is the same from community to community. That's what the industry wanted to do. 
Um, the league was caught short on this a little. However, the league did put together a team that worked with the industry and they did come up with the compromise of this application and affidavit and license agreement. And the state law says every city in town has to have the forms approved by July 1st of this year. Then what will happen is companies who currently have the license agreements, like for example, we have Mediacom and CenturyLink who have very well negotiated agreements from years ago. Most of it's getting gutted. That's what's happening, most of it. And so what you're gonna end up with, you still get the 5% of the gross revenues. You still get that. However, there's a lot of things that you won't be able to do anymore. You won't be able to tell the company, you have to build out the system with your cable TV system. You have to do that. Um, that's not allowed, that won't be allowed anymore. Uh, and there's some other things that will not be allowed like complaints, who's gonna handle the complaints, um, how that's done. The state gets involved also. If, if, they, if someone feels that the city and town is violating SB 1140, the complaint goes to the state and the state gets to arbitrate that. So that's how this was set up and cities and towns are required to approve the application and affidavit and license agreement form. So you're not approving the Mediacom and CenturyLink agreement. You're just agreeing to, okay, if they want to do these forms, um, they can, and it's now, it will be available to them. And they have a year to decide to do that. And they have till 2020, July of 2020, to actually sign the agreement. If they don't, then the current agreement stays in place. So. I don't know what those two companies will do, but it does take some of the mandatory requirements out and all they, what the city gets out of it is a 5% uh, license fee. So I, I would request that you follow the law and approve the application and affidavit and license agreement forms. Any questions or discussion? So this really isn't a question, it's kind of a statement to some of our state legislators. Why don't they just take over the whole thing and license a, a cable video for the whole state and just leave the city out of it altogether? That's, I, don't I don't ask for an answer, but that's something for our state legislators to think about. They need to stop legislating local stuff and just start worrying about their own issues that they have to deal with. Anyway, that's all I got. You feel better? <laughs> so this is obviously on consent and you would advise us that we will. That vote. you approve the forms yeah. uh, as uh, mandated under SB 1140. Yes. Yeah, they have really good lobbyists. And if we don't? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't, don't um, That's a good you, question. the question, well, the answer would be some legislator from Yuma or from Colorado City can basically call the AG up and say, hey, AJ's violating the law. You need to look into that. <laughs> and then the AG has 30 days to do it. They'll give the city about two weeks to respond. And then they make a decision on whether the city's violating the rules. If the city, if they determine the city is, then uh, they will basically say, okay, you need to fix this within 30 days. And if you don't, state share revenues uh, gets withheld. That's what happens. That can happen. Okay. So those watching on home have a better idea now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Presentation and discussion on resolution number 19-14, declaring as a public record certain document filed with city clerk entitled amendments. <laughs> This is going to uh, be Mr. There. Mayor, that yeah. one and the, the other two can be done at the same time. All right, so I'm also going to read <gasps> item number five, presentation and discussion on ordinance number 1475, amending city code, and presentation and discussion on proposed ordinance number 1476. And these will be the Larry and Dave show. <laughs> yeah. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Larry Kirsch, Director of Development Services, Dave Zellner, building official. 
Uh, we did update a staff memo that was in your packet that uh, clarified, I think there were four items in there that we uh, gave you information on. We also gave you a copy of the uh, regulations or ordinance, if you will, that also showed uh, with yellow highlighting the changes uh, for your uh, decision and action possibly tomorrow night. So if you do decide to go forward, we will have to make some amendments uh, to the so-called clean version, as Joel likes to call it, uh, for your final adoption. But we're here to answer any questions you might have. And would those amendments be made tomorrow or tonight? What would be the easiest way? Mm -hmm. would be the easiest? Well, I think you talk about everything tonight, and then tomorrow night it'd be in your motion if you want to make any amendments. So who wants to... Uh, Start that off. I have, yeah. I have a question, but Go I don't know if Chip did. So, we got a couple people that had different areas we were looking at on the fences where it says. I, I'm not sure that I'm reading this right. Fences or block walls not over six feet. It, uh, under alternative three and four. There's this, the not, the word not was kind of confusing in there. Fences are block walls not over six feet in height. Blah, blah, blah. Page Fences 18. in the front yard need a permit. Last not time. over. 17. Page what? 17? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mine's zoom. It's 18. Page, Page 18. 18. I had it zoomed in so much big I couldn't let's see there. See if I can. Matt's, uh, let's just see. The word Getting not it. just kind of threw me. It's okay. like, can you clarify All that? Right. It's not registering for some reason. The exemption. So the exemption applies for everything under six feet. So less than. It just weird. It just reads weird it's with like the word not. Like a double negative, not. you're saying? Is that yeah, saying? it okay. just reads weird with the word not in it. That was my only. I don't know if anybody else had any other questions, but. Chip, I I didn't have questions on the not, but in the aspect is that. Um, the number two fences or block walls not over six feet in height measured in three feet from the existing side. Fences considered in federal patented easements and I have to turn the page adjacent to public right of ways or across uh, natural drainage ways require zoning review. Um, is that just basically, in a sense, the idea is coming forward to try to verify that uh, whoever's putting up the fence is not putting them into these areas? Yes, sir. That's correct. So those are, the, those are the areas that we typically run problems with, people that are fencing off washes and then they catch debris and then Public Works is out there getting debris out of a fence, usually along the roadway. But uh, yes, that's the intent. So that same language, uh, we tried to, four is kind of a combo of uh, some of the above, if you will. Mm -hmm. So uh, four has that same language that we carry down in case you consider that as one of the options. So we have that. So again, why would we have the <coughs> word not in there and what? Not, what? Uh, yeah, I can probably get there. Yeah, okay. So it, it, it that was that's the I'm pretty sure that's the language that's standard in the code. So that's just what has always been. I mean, if you said under six feet, would that be mean the same thing or six feet or under? Whatever. It, it, I, I, yeah, you could. That's the Joel thing. Joel, any you want to say less than six feet? I'm just asking. Yeah, you know, yeah, means same six less feet than or less. Uh, you would say. Then you'd yeah. have to say six feet. Otherwise, you've excluded the, the six, six feet. feet. Right. Yeah. It's become six feet five left. feet. Whatever. Five feet eleven and yeah. Three quarters. Fifteen sixteen. Fifteen sixteen oh, right. inches. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I threw that out for a suggestion. How many places in the code is this language? This is the only it's place. Everywhere. No, it's, in the, it's in the retaining walls, yeah. which are not over four feet. So where it says not over, you want to say 
west end. So if you look at the next one, exterior concrete such as stoops, uncovered patios. There's your not, not over again. Yeah, it's everywhere. It's yeah. in it's, every it's, piece of it. Yeah, it's so, in there. So, so it includes This is that. a continuous use. It's just kind of the. We have an English teacher now. Code. <laughs> <laughs> code it's just continuous. It's, it's a given, you know, throughout the code. And it's not just here, it's anywhere that you are excluding one part from the other. It will say not over or not under. It, it's the language that's used within the code. So it's more of a style thing, I guess. Routine. There is a different way to say it, but that's the. the the way it's stated. Standard. But if you change it one place, will you have to therefore change it everywhere throughout the entire code? If that's the motion. If that would be. Oh, oh that's ridiculous. <laughs> well, there could be a broad motion that says, wherever it says not, you say West End, I'm not including. That doesn't work either. But there'll be other places be where it the, says the not. The number of feet, like in D, it has to say four feet, which is which retaining walls, which are four feet or less, okay. has to do that in order four, to mean the same thing. Four feet or under? Yeah. It means the same thing. It does, it's but identical. it's a style. I think it is a style thing. Yeah. So the motion, if, if there's a motion, it can say that wherever that's done in the code. And I don't know, I mean, if that's what you want to do, that's something you all might want to work on tomorrow. And identify every single location. <laughs> Would you like to offer for that, Charles? Or wait till <laughs> I, I'm in deposition, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, we did have four. Two of them are right in front of you here, but these are the, with related to the building permits for uh, the shade structures or gazebos or uh, <clears throat> pergolas, that's parent B. Parent one, we had to add the word enclosed so that we would keep the requirement for structures uh, 120 feet or less. And then we had the fence thing. We had the typo that Chip found on the, the, <laughs> the, the number four was inserted. And then uh, the correct uh, language, if you will, for the energy code. Those are the four items that we identified anyway in the yeah. staff memo and, I, and I didn't see the four again so thank you we did well we highlighted it but yeah, yeah. and this was really appreciated I, the red I, line and the highlighting I got one question and I and I no, want to make who's sure I'm, control? Who's, who's moving oh, I'm not sure it was scrolling through uh, yes <laughs> Mr. Wilson <laughs> Well, we're just flying through it off. Right. <laughs> yeah, this was the other thing, was just the correct uh, reference to the, the correct energy code. You had made a, a mention, Larry, that you know, for <coughs> the um, shades that um, they can't be in the, the front yard. And I know it was done in passing in the conversation that we had the other night. And... <clears throat> And I mentioned that, uh, realize that there's some properties out there because either the house was built prior to somebody purchasing the property where the house was built all the way to the back of the property. And so I wanted to know what the definition of the front yard is. So I would say 95% of the time it's where your address is. So, but we do have, and we just did a rezoning a few, where we have these areas of the city where people are driving down easements, these, uh, we did 40 lots a couple weeks ago where we rezone an entire neighborhood. Some of them don't necessarily even have legal access, but those addresses are off the main street. That's an, an exception. So the, if you're talking about the, the large lot area, so if your address is on, if your house is has addressed on Smoke Tree, that's your front yard. Smoke Tree is your front yard. If your address would be a different street, so it's it's basically where the address is. So that's from the front of the house all the way to the street is the definition of the front yard, correct? The, yeah, that's how we do the setbacks, front, rear, side uh, setbacks. <clears throat> so, so again, a corner lot, we have talked in cases where we've had to change their address 
because of where they want their swimming pool, things like that. So we end up changing their address. The front of the house may still face, so when we first issue a building permit, the front of the house is where the house faces the street. But we, again, we have odd exceptions where someone says, hey, I want to do a pool, but I want it here. Can I change my address? And we usually try to work it out. We've had some cases where they did need to go to the Board of Adjustment to change their address because of where they wanted to put their pool. But I would say, by and large, where the front of your house is, that is where we put the street address. So could they apply for a variance yes. if they wanted to put it in the front? We have uh, the, the Board of Adjustment, again, because of the unusual nature of the lot. Maybe there's mm -hmm. a wash flowing through it. Maybe, again, Talk there has to be it. something. To get a variance, it has to be something peculiar to the lot. You can't just issue a variance because they ask nicely. So it does, uh, and there's Joel could go on infinitum about variances and that there, the hardship has to be something peculiar about the lot. Like drainage, maybe? Or drainage, it's, yeah, steep slope, something like that, sure. And, and what about a home that was built <clears throat> years ago <laughs> to the back of the property, and now, even though it's in the zoning area where they can have livestock, and now that the, the new owners decide to have uh, livestock, can they, what, what, how would they go through with the idea of having a uh, corral and shades in the front yard? Well, we don't, corral's right now in the zoning code, so that's a zoning code, not necessarily a building code question, but um, we allow uh, a corral because it's not a structure to be in the front yard. The one that we're talking about has to meet setbacks, that's a zoning code provision. So. Uh, if someone puts their house way in the back, whatever structure they put up, even though it might not require a permit now, still has to meet setbacks. Mm -hmm. And again, if there's an unusual circumstance about the property, then they could ask for a variance. So the zone, it's really the zoning code that prescribes where a building can be on the property. So just because they built the house to the rear of the property, there's still a 40-foot front yard setback mm -hmm. in that particular zoning district in the RSGR. Okay. Yes, understand that. So structure has to meet, if it's a quote unquote structure, it has to meet the zoning code provisions. I just want the ability to know that the people realize that some of the lots, there is ways of around the aspect of our, our zoning requirements that the, they can't have something like that in their front yard, but we do have the ability to uh, say come in with I'll call it exceptions, because of uh, the property, because of some something that's different on their property that prevents them from having that ability to put it into their backyard. Yeah, weeks wash, palm wash, those are certainly reasonable uh, circumstances where someone might, might need a variance. And the, and we have actually counseled people who wanted to put their house at the back of the lot and just said, hey, be aware, this is going to impact these things and sometimes they do change their mind on that. Yeah. So we well, try to point that out as we're dealing with permits. We did try to talk someone who was building a mother-in-law unit in the floodplain <laughs> that they probably <laughs> probably should not <laughs> try to do that. That sounded interesting. Serious. I'm trying did to that on purpose. <laughs> I, I said Which I hope you, you like your mother-in-law but <laughs> again um, we do try to talk to folks at the counter and say you know you're going to pay flood insurance if you put this guest I'll call it a guest house in the floodplain maybe you want to rethink that. <laughs> but certainly we talk to people all the time about the detachable about that foundation so that they can set yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well I, I appreciate that information and the aspect on it because uh, I, I want to make sure that everyone realizes there is way that we do have the ability to make I'll say Exception. some exceptions to to meet the I'll say the needs of the property and then how it's designed because I and I do know of one individual that uh, came in and purchased property, built the house all the way back to the back of the property. He didn't want any animals or anything. The property is now sold. Someone else has it, and they want to bring in animals. So, yeah, yeah and that's currently allowed by the code. Corrals don't have to meet setbacks. Okay. Any other questions or anything that you need from us? So. Well, on the fence night, right? permit, I still like alternative number four, 
from our discussion that we had at our last meeting. And when too bad this doesn't fit on one page right now. I guess we can we downsize. You guys can shrink it yeah. down. We can. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> there you go. Maybe more. When Maybe Krista more was time. talking at the last meeting about the non-climb fence and hog wire or split rail, none of those, if I understand it correctly, are allowed in the front yard. Is that what? Is that the way I read it? No, uh, like you could have a split rail fence. You can have a split rail. Sure. So what, so what materials are allowed as a fence in the front yard? There are prohibited fence materials in the code, whether it's front, rear, or side. Okay. So, you know, barbed wire type fences, fences that aren't made out of recognized fencing material that you would go to Home Depot or a building supply store. So we do prohibit uh, like galvanized panels, things that aren't typically associated as fence material. Those are already prohibited. Okay, but the main problem, as I understand it, is in the right-of-ways, putting their fence in the right-of-way. But it's not that kind of material that really is causing the problem. It, it's the material that's not approved, but when a owner, say, puts a six-foot block wall in his front yard, in the right of way. That's where the problems come in because A, it was expensive to build and B, if the city wants it gone because they built it in the wrong place, do we or do we not have to move it? I think the answer was we do not have to move it. They have to move it. If they built it in our right of way, they have to move it. Have to move okay. it. The idea was is, is can we have a conversation with them before they do that? Absolutely. And I did have a slideshow a couple of work sessions ago where I showed the slideshow where they had the the footing, the bricks, so the, the picture early was just where the footing was for the block wall, mm -hmm. came back later in the day and someone had delivered all the bricks and it was right behind the the rolled curb. Mm -hmm. So that's, again, that's there's different circumstances for different types of neighborhoods. That's where in a conventional type subdivision where Folks just don't know where the right of way is. Some of the right of ways are 50, some are 66, and so you don't know whether your your property line starts, you know, seven, eight, nine, or 17 feet behind the curb. That's where we run into problems. Well, I think to have a minimal fee charge so that they come in and that you have a chance to educate them where the right of way is is not harmful in any ways, and in future building of people's fences in the front yard, at least we've educated them. I, I don't know, can they sign something that they came in and had a conversation? Um, yes, Councilmember, there could be a document that Development Services requires in order to get that um, permit or pay the fee. There's, a, there's some misconception out there that adverse possession, which is a legal term, basically means some people think that because the fence or barrier has been there for 20, 30, 40 years, they think that that's now their property. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work against public property. Mm -hmm. That's the rule. It may work against another person's private property. They still have to go to court and get a court to declare uh, this is a quiet tile action, that's what it's called, and then the judge decides whether the statute's met. Usually it's a, the, aver the, 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 the average one is a 10-year statute of limitations where someone has to be openly, notoriously, that's, those are the legal terms of, of basically possessing that property or taking control of it. But that doesn't work against the government, against any government. Right. But getting back to the form, um, I think about a year, year and a half ago, we had someone build a pool in their backyard, it happened to be the floodplain line, even though there was a, a block wall in their backyard, I think it was in Renaissance Point, I'm not sure, but behind there is, is the floodplain. So we came up with, through Maricopa County Flood Control, said, oh, here's a sample affidavit, if you will. So we have notaries here basically said, I hereby acknowledge I'm building um, my pool, happens to be in the floodplain. So you're not supposed to build structures in the floodplain. The flood control district has made exceptions for pools because not too many people are going to get, you know, it's not a house or anything like that. So we came up with an affidavit, pretty simple. I think we've only used it once. Um, 
so we could very simply come up with an affidavit. And it should be recorded. That one, I don't think we, did we signed it, they signed it. It so. should be recorded. Yeah. Okay. Did they not need a permit to build a pool? Correct, but yeah. we couldn't, what happened was because the pool was in the floodplain, that's the first time that staff we had encountered that. So we called Maricopa County, we talked to Emil Schmidt, what do we do about a pool in the floodplain? He's the floodplain administrator, not necessarily us. So we worked with Emil, Maricopa County Flood Control came up with this kind of no harm, no foul. Yeah, go ahead and build a pool. You're kind of doing it at your own risk because it's in the floodplain, but it's not a habitable structure, so it was treated a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. My only point of that example is that we did create this type of form that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So Robin, yeah, your, <laughs> your front yard fence yes, is set back from Yes, sir. Your, your front street. So how would you feel if s someone came by and said, you know, sorry, you gotta move it? Well, I didn't check with development services. I didn't, this is, that's my error, and I would probably move it. Wouldn't be happy, but it's my own fault. I was stupid. Well, and, and I guess that's kind of my point. That was an expensive view, yeah, uh, view and block fence. Like buyer beware. I mean, if you, it's at, it does, it does, it's not at the city expense. I don't understand why we keep hashing this same issue over and over and over. We've hammered it and hammered it and hammered it. It's not at the city expense, it's at the owner's expense, and there's a mechanism for dealing with it. Well, there's a mechanism for dealing with just about anything. Right. And it's almost all of it at the owner's expense. So, you know, we could just throw all the zoning codes out, all the building codes out, et cetera, and just be done with it. Well, I don't and think that would, you know, buyer beware. I, I don't think anybody Sorry. is suggesting that, but th this one issue is a sticking point that is, Joel has clarified every single time we've talked about it. It's not, you know, the city has a mechanism for dealing with it. It's at the owner's expense. If they have to move it, they have to move it. Regardless of, it, you know, you're talking about, well, wouldn't you be upset and didn't it cost a lot of money? That's... That's not the city's problem, really. Well, I think well, I think what Gail's trying to get at is that, you know, we understand. It's at the owner's expense. We got that. What Gail's trying to get at, I think, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, is that the city can offer a way that somebody dumb like me would not be <laughs> out that expense. And the city currently does not offer that. That's all she's saying. Mm -hmm. The city can offer this way and say, hey, you're building your little, little, what's mine, about three and a half foot fence <laughs> up. Um, here's where your line is. That's, that's what she's saying. She's just trying to give people the opportunity to take advantage of it. If they don't, they don't. Yeah. And then it's their problem. Exactly, to do it right the first time to alleviate. I mean, we have the ability to upset people on a regular basis <laughs> because they didn't know what they should or shouldn't do. This just gives that we can tell them this is where it can go. This is where you should build it. This is your lines. This is the right of way. <coughs> because most people, and I've sold a lot of vacant land, have no clue whatsoever about net and gross and right of ways and federal <coughs> net easement. <coughs> It's a simple education process. I, I'm sure fence builders wouldn't have an issue coming in and doing this because they're more aware of where things can go and know that they don't necessarily know on every road that it's 33 feet from the center of the road. Didn't the gentleman that just did the presentation with the GIS, the GIS say that for some, in certain situations that we would need a surveyor? I mean, it's really up to people if they're going to put something like that, do something like that to, to know where their property lines are. It really is if they're buying and selling property and building on property and near property lines. I mean, he even said that the, they weren't going to, in a lot of the situations, they weren't going to rely on the city, that it would be <coughs> a registered surveyor. Surveyors are, surveys are always better because mm -hmm. then you have a professional that you could rely on and it's a stamped uh, document. They're a professional engine, uh, professional surveyor, and then they, basically, if they mess up, you have someone to go back on. However, 
if I signed something with development services that said that this was my line and I went ahead and built my wall on that line, then I'm going to come back at him if somebody comes after me. Survey or no survey. <laughs> that's, that's true, but the, the, the affidavit will say that they take on the risk, and then, that, then it should be recorded with the county recorder's office. Or add that as to I saw my so, house on one of those dots one a couple weeks ago. So many cities do require surveys just to even get a building permit. We do not do that. Many cities require a survey when you go to the Board of Adjustment or the, to get a variance. Because in order to get a variance, which is a pretty substantial document, is if you're going to know if I need a six-inch variance or a one-foot variance, that variance uh, is set because, oh, the house, I want to build my house uh, into the setback. Many cities require a survey just to get on the docket of the, and we don't do that either. So, um, you know, many things are, a survey is the most accurate. Our lot lines that JC showed, the base for that is the SRP because the county assessor's parcel lines don't, aren't all that accurate, at least on the GIS standpoint. They're not surveyed lines. Mm -hmm. So when someone comes in and we worked with a couple down on Hale Drive for a long time, and they started a front porch without a permit. And so we, again, this council amended the ordinance that says, yes, now I can build a front porch 10 foot into my front setback. They had no idea where the, their lot line started. And their lot line started 17 feet back from the back of the curb. And so we can go there if there's a plat and we can show them where the city's right of way is. So actually, if there's a recorded plat, that helps. But exactly where the pins are, in the corner, if the pins are still there after 50, 60 years, that all kind of <coughs> comes into play. Anyway, so for you folks, you get the uh, privilege of <laughs> picking one of the four, none of the four, whatever you want to do. Again, uh, alternative one is status quo. I think I said that. Alternative three is basically if it were, I think, three and a half feet, if you look at alternative three, that's what the city of Mesa does right now. So again, in the front yard, no permit for six feet in the rear and side yards. In Mesa, if you want to put a fence up in your front yard uh, and it's over, uh, it's over three and a half feet, so I would basically say alternative three under parent C there, 3C, that's what Mesa does today. Alternative four is really, depending on what you pick, would be MESA along with this recognition that we do have these FPEs and some circumstances. So again, you folks can decide what you want to do. But so. Your Honor. Yes. This item's on for public hearing tomorrow. We've also included in your packet the information I think we put in about 18 cities and towns just for your information of the years of their current building codes. It's something that I do here from the development community and the private sector about when are you going to get into the 18 codes, Brian? When are you going to do the 18? That's They, they want to know because they're all now having to do double work to figure out what the 06 number is. Okay. Is everybody confident going in tomorrow? Mm, your Honor. Yes. Okay, some, I have some fun. So, I'm um, administration and enforcement. So, <coughs> Dave, you are the um, building and safety manager, officially? Yes. A lot of power in here for you. So, let me just answer, Your Honor, the, there are two people in the city government <coughs> that are legally, when they raise their right hand to the squ square, can go to jail if they um, are inaccurate in their work. One is the city engineer and one is the building official. So I think that we want to make sure, Matt, if you can help some of these clarifications on where Councilmember Schroeder is going on the administrative code, because I think we're working off something that we're already and have been doing for <coughs> 20 years. Yeah, the current code isn't that much different than we've had adopted since the 1997 administrative code, but so yeah. the the administration and the, the powers and the duties are about the same. So look, let me give you a scenario. Correct. Um, let's say someone had a 
a slat out of their fence. And someone called up and said, hey, my neighbor's got a slat out of the fence. Code enforcement goes out there and say, hey, you know what? You got to put this slat in this fence. Now, according to this, and again, is it, if this is the way it's always been, please let me know. Now that code enforcement can go inside of their house, no. go in their backyard, they have all entry to all their council homes. member. Yeah. No, the Fourth Amendment requires a warrant to go into someone's house unless there is ex exigent circumstances. And a missed slat would not be exigent circumstances. Um, this language is, is very customary, and it, it, does not <clears throat> it does not let this gentleman violate the Fourth Amendment. And uh, if someone says, I don't want you to come into my house, then a warrant would have to be obtained. So to get a warrant, you'd have to have an affidavit sworn by an officer and the, that person would have to explain to a judge why he thinks there, he or she thinks there's a violation in the house. So there's a judicial remedy for that. And, and most of the time, you know, we haven't done warrants here in so long. Um, it comes up once in a while, but usually it's resolved with the property owner. So I understand you have some reservations about that kind of authority, but the Fourth Amendment is the ultimate authority. And it is, it is observed by employees of the city from what I have seen. I, I think the question might be, and, and, maybe, and I may, maybe I'm wrong, but on page eight in the beginning where it talks about building safety manager, it talks about del delegating that power of authority. And I understand the difference between coming in the house, but it talks about delegating the power of authority onto a code of <coughs> compliance officer. Am I reading that wrong? It, it, it says that it talks, it, that's exactly what it talks about. If you determine that you know, somebody else in the department, it looks to me the way that it reads is it's delegating that authority. It'd be the same way it works for the PD. Chief Kelly has designated certain authority and he bequeaths that authority on his officers. So, so we'd saying. be policing the people. No. It's can, we, can we dial this back a little bit? Yeah, I This think, is the building code. Yeah. This doesn't have to do with a slat out of a fence, which actually is chapter nine. So if someone is violate, that's, that's, the, that's the property maintenance code. So if someone has a, a slat out of place, it would be a, a code officer, not a building, the building inspector. So let's make sure that the building code is someone's building a house, that's what we're there to inspect. If someone's remodeling their house, that's what they're there to inspect. If someone has a zoning violation or a property maintenance violation, that's a separate code. So we do have code officers that do zoning code in, uh, enforcement and property maintenance code enforcement. So we wouldn't be driving down the street and seeing a slat out of a fence and getting a warrant to go get them to fix it. It would be a letter, it would be a notice of violation, it wouldn't even be under the building code. If it's a fence, that's gonna tip over and fall and hurt somebody, then that may be a building, building code issue because then it's a structure if it's over six feet. If I may, Mayor, yes. pardon me. I think the, the perception is, okay, you, you get this kind of authority and then that allows you to go and actually look at other things. I think that is your concern. Is that correct, Council Member? I'm reading number G. And <coughs> someone would humor me. In Where it. exactly are you at? Um, oh, page 10, and there is no B. I don't know if that's just a typo or not, but G. G. I got EFG. What's the title? Oh, you're, on, you're on the wrong thing. My, I'm on page 10. I'm trying to get my page 10. Page 10 is a different page 10, I guess. All right, what section of you are, sir? <laughs> and there, there you go. There you go. Go down. Go down to. So now. Yeah. Right. And that's that is very similar, if not identical, to the state law regarding right of entry. So this Yes, and under the Fourth Amendment, that would be the exigent yeah, circumstance where you would not need a warrant. But those are, how many cases do you have that that would come up? 
I mean, very limited in the time that you've been here, correct? Right, probably one a year, maybe. If that. And those are extreme cases, and what kind of things would you consider unsafe, uh, dangerous, or hazardous? Um, we've had houses <coughs> filled with feces. We've had um, open sewage uh, violations. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we've had it. The, we had the electrical where they were, had the electrical hooked up and were running a generator with 19 people. So, but in all those cases, we were able to get permission. So. But didn't we have an issue? I, I can't remember when it was. It was last fall, I think it was, where we had a property that was, had pictures yeah. taken of it, and it was definitely a health hazard, and we had to go through the county health department to alleviate the issue and, and, and get the sewage repaired and the feces removed. And, but that was, we had to go through the county health department, um, and they handled it. Well, we attempted to go through the county health right. department, and that uh, we ended up. Some of that you could see from the right of way, yeah. the buckets of uh, feces. So some of that, again, it was an imminent public health. Yeah. We attempted to get the county. They're very helpful in some circumstances, and not so much in others. And that was a case where it wasn't clear who the property owner was because the property right. owner was a uh, basically a scape or a uh, on on the loose, on the lamb. So again, uh, it was hard to, Yeah. but anyway. But where the, the right of entry is, the, part of this deals with, you call for an inspection, we have the right to go there and inspect the property, right? So you get a building permit, you call for an inspection, we have the right to go there and do the inspection. There would be other cases where um, after a fire, or we had the cactus that, the saguaro that basically landed on top of a, a mobile home manufactured home and so we have to go declare a dangerous structure so these these a through q are just basically on par with the state's regulations and the other yeah. and many of these are from the 1997 the mm -hmm. current administrative code so we have a 1997 administrative code i think the language that you talked about when you're on the phone uh two weeks ago um a and B, I think, are verbatim of what we currently have in the 1997 code that the council, I guess, readopted <coughs> in 2006. Okay. Um, Krista, did you want to bring? Oh, we're just um, under building safety and safety manager on page eight. It specifically says the officer or other designated authority charged with administration and enforcement of this chapter. Um, it does say that a code compliance officer can be. Uh, at the end it states that shall be construed to mean the building safety manager and I understand your analogy of using the police department delegating authority but there's a difference between your expertise and a code compliance officer's expertise and so I think it's, it seems a little concerning that a code compliance officer could be given the, the authority. So is this a code compliance officer that is, is doing building code? I don't I mean, building code. We have one permit tech. Right? I mean, we have one building official that building inspector. I mean, inspector. Code compliance officer. I mean, I just want to make sure we understand delegation of duties. Who's doing what positions? The, yeah, so we have right now we have one combination in, in building inspector and plan reviewer. He's a combo, and myself mm -hmm. in the building division, and then we have the permit techs. So. Um, the other three are code enforcement officers and they may go out and look at like the vehicle ran into the house. Mm -hmm. So Rick is the code mm -hmm. enforcement officer. So he went and looked at that just to kind of give us an idea of what's up, what we might need to do with that. So, um, but, but to, uh, to, to do a dangerous building, you have to sign that. Right. A code officer. Right. They, no, they can do dangerous building. They can do so. But after review, it's not like they go out there. Dave has I can't a even long process to do did. that. Yeah. Isn't this kind of like when you get a babysitter and you tell your kid, this person is me when I'm gone. You will listen. I mean, aren't we just saying that what this officer is doing is saying what is the, the ordinance? 
what has to be done. I mean, the, the, it is very important. Their training, their certification are very important for the very reasons you're talking about. So, but I don't know that, uh, you know, we could hire, I guess, a whole bunch of CBO building officials, and, <coughs> mm -hmm. but I'm not sure how affordable that would be. Right. So. My only concern was is delegating the authority to somebody that doesn't have your expertise in these some of these situations. You have expertise, you know, here, and some people that don't have your training or you know your background may not be to be insulting, but they just don't have that background. Maybe at you know a different level. So to be uh -huh. giving them the authority to make any determinations or whatever, the way it's worded just seems a little concerning to me. You know, not trying to uh, suggest that. It just seems odd to me to delegate authority to somebody that doesn't have your expertise in certain situations. And, but that's what that says. It's not specifying in code compliance, you know, that the type of field that code compliance officers would handle. It's saying they would have your, <laughs> their, your, their, your authority. What you so so it does, just to clarify, so deputies, it says in accordance with any applicable city procedure. So, you know, that would, you know, and we're still working on getting those written, but, uh, you know, it's not that they get a blanket <coughs> go out and do whatever you want. That's not what's intended or proposed. So, Dave, if you sent someone out, not you, to do something that was not appropriate, would you still get arrested or would the person that did it? If I sent somebody that I knew didn't have the capability so to make the, the judgment, then yes, I would probably still get arrested. That's negligence on my behalf. And that's the whole thing. It, you wouldn't send someone out. You're not going to send Jennifer out to right. do something on your job. You would only send either yourself or, and usually on a problem, you go out anyways. Right. At, at some point, it, it involved, you know, if, it, if it's going to result in a condemnation, making somebody move out of something, then I'm going to be involved. That's what's appropriate. So. Just so this is, the, I, this is, uh, I, just to bring it around to a different, I, I ran in hospitals and nursing homes for years, and we had policies and procedures and everything that went along with it. And me being the administrator of the facility had just that, that same verbiage in our policies and procedures that I had the the ability and the responsibility to designate authority to those people who I deem to have the expertise and knowledge to carry out the duties that I felt they had. And if I did, some, if I told Johnny to do something and he, and he ultimately didn't have the knowledge or ability to do it, it fell upon me and I got in trouble for it. And so this verbiage isn't anything different from any other industry or, or policies and procedures that are out there. Um, it all comes down to us as, a, as us as a city council relying upon Bryant, who has the ultimate authority because he's the city manager, to delegate his authority down as it goes to whoever it is, and then it goes down to the department level and then the sub-department level and everything. So this is something where we have to have reliance upon the people that we put in charge to carry out the duties that we set the policies for. And we, and we did have a question um, in regards to code enforcement and the delegation from the city manager. So to clear that up, we had him write the letter and say, so we have the document now that says that they, the power that they were in the, you know, in the code allowed had been approved to go to them so i mean <coughs> i mean policies and procedures are a big deal and and we don't have a lot of that fleshed out we've done more with the code enforcement um with just two people it's kind of you know fairly uh understood but um yeah so i i think i would look at it the decision the decisions to deny somebody a permit is going to come back to me to um to you know, declare a building unsafe and have it condemned and have it torn down or that kind of thing is going to come back to me. It's not going to be delegated out. May, I have, may have somebody go get the pictures and say, okay, yeah, it does need to be addressed, but they're not going to ultimately be the ones.
anything more. Is, is there other information you want us to bring back tomorrow that would address that or compare it to other places or anything? Does adopting this code also help with the ISO rating that the fire department tries for? for right, so the, there's an ISO rating for fire department that's based on somewhat on their inspection programs, but may, mainly their response times, the availability of water supply and stuff like that. For building code, it's based on the knowledge and education levels of the different people that are applying the, in their experience. That's kind of how they evaluate <laughs> the codes that are adopted. And they get into a little bit about procedures and stuff like that. They would, you know, if, if we had some kind of weird administrative code that wasn't fairly standard, they might have a question about it. But in general, they're, you know, is it pretty much the what's in the building code with local amendments and then, you know, that kind of thing. So. So that all applies <coughs> towards the ISO ratings, right, right. correct? Yeah, that's, is that the BSEG? B yes, yep. Yeah. So there's, a, I don't even know what the acronym stands for, but it's also in the floodplain rules, mm -hmm. um, you have to look at the building codes. Are your building codes up to date? If the city ever tries to get in what's called the community rating system where premiums can be lowered, they also look at adoption of the building codes. The fire department's under 2015 right now, whether, and that was um, Dave Montgomery, was that his name? Mm -hmm. He got that done before he retired, so whether they decide to go to the 2018, who knows, but we've uh, tried to keep in step with the fire department. It was Bushwa. No, Montgomery. Well, Chief was. He was the chief. Chief, 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 chief was the was Montgomery. Definitely right, but fire. But fire. anyway, they, the, the fire department, maybe the reason they got down to an ISO of two was because they, at least the 2015 yeah, codes. Had an impact. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll see you all tomorrow night then. Thank you. Okay, if there's nothing else, then we'll be adjourned till tomorrow. <laughs>